Beneath the hushed reverence that blankets the National Library of Sweden lies a tome that whispers of ancient secrets and ungodly pacts. The Codex Gigas, a colossal manuscript of medieval origin, rests within its own special enclave, a darkened alcove where soft, directional light barely touches its weathered leather binding, casting elongated shadows that play on the surrounding walls. Crafted from the skins of over a hundred donkeys, its pages are a testament to a time when books were as rare as they were sacred, and to create one was an act of piety and a work of art. The Codex Gigas, however, is not merely a book, but an enigma wrapped in leather, parchment, and legend. Its sheer size is enough to dwarf any other manuscript, at three feet in length and weighing in at an astounding 165 pounds. It is a monolithic presence in the archive. The cover is an ominous presence, adorned with ornate metal fittings and fastenings that seem less designed to keep the book closed and more to restrain something within. The spine is ridged with age, and the clasp, intricately wrought, suggests a craftsmanship that is almost otherworldly in its complexity. As one approaches the tome, the air seems to grow heavier as if the book exudes an aura of its ancient lore. The dark leather is etched with inscrutable symbols that have faded with the passage of centuries. These marks, which might once have been gilded or brightly colored, now only suggest their former vibrancy, offering a muted hint to the mysteries that the Codex holds. Opening the Gigas is an act few are privileged to perform, and it reveals a parchment hue that is remarkably preserved with the writing and illustrations resisting the ravages of time. The ink upon the pages seems unfaded, as if it were set down not centuries, but merely days ago. Its Latin script is executed with a precision that defies the variability of the human hand, suggesting either a supernatural steadiness or a lifetime of dedication that borders on the obsessive. Throughout the volume, there are decorations of startling beauty, illuminated letters and borders that contain a curious blend of the somber and the vibrant. Yet, it is not the artistry that causes the spine to tingle, but the haunting full-page portrait of the devil, inked into the vellum with such detail that it seems to pulse with a life of its own. This arresting image is set against an eerie backdrop, an ostensibly deserted castle or monastery, and surrounded by smaller illustrations that appear to be writhing in torment. The origins of this devil's Bible are as dark and uncertain as the portrait itself. Some believe it was the life's work of a single scribe, an unnamed monk whose story is lost to time and whose drive to create this book may have been fueled by more than human ambition. For in the quiet corners of the library, it is said that whispers of an ancient pact still linger, a story that begins with a condemned man's desperate gamble for redemption, or perhaps damnation. This is the mystery that shrouds the Codex Gigas, a mystery that has survived the ages, as enduring and impenetrable as the book itself. It is within the dense, script-laden pages of the Codex Gigas where one finds the visage of the fallen angel himself. This image has given the volume the moniker, The Devil's Bible, a title that echoes through the halls of history and the annals of legend. Far from a mere embellishment, the illustration is a masterful depiction that arrests the viewer with a confluence of awe and dread. The devil is portrayed not as a creature of chaos, but almost nobly, seated with a stately poise that belies his nefarious nature. His countenance is hauntingly serene, eyes deep set beneath a brow, furrowed not in anger, but in contemplation. His hands and fingers are elongated, delicate, and almost elegant, resting calmly upon his legs. Yet, despite this tranquil demeanor, there is an undercurrent of malice that pervades the portrait, for this is a being of immense power and unfathomable intent. The depiction's backdrop is as much a character in this portrayal as the devil himself. He sits before an absence of civilization, a hollow, deserted cityscape that suggests a realm bereft of humanity's touch. Buildings are stark and geometric. 
their angularity casting shadows that seem to allude to hidden depths and darker corners where secrets lie. Above the devil's head, an absence of detail creates an aura that might be a halo or simply a void, challenging the viewer to interpret a symbol that sits in the margins of religious iconography and the supernatural. This singular page in the tome stands in stark contrast to the surrounding religious texts. The juxtaposition of the Holy Writ and this diabolic depiction raises silent questions. Was it meant to serve as a warning, a representation of the eternal struggle between good and evil, inserted among the sacred words as a reminder of the thin veil between sin and virtue? Or does it speak of a deeper bond between the book and the Prince of Darkness? A visual confession of the Codex's true genesis. Around the figure, the margin swells with smaller illustrations that seem to be caught in a perpetual dance of agony and ecstasy. Angels and demons appear intertwined, locked in a silent battle that has neither beginning nor end, a loop of struggle etched in ink and age. The artistry of the devil's portrait is a riddle. Its creator has rendered it with such nuance that it could only be the product of an intimate knowledge of scripture and theology, mixed with a fearless approach to the taboo. One might assume it to be the work of a heretic, yet the devil is bound within a volume of holy texts, as if to anchor him within the very fabric of faith he opposes. This stark duality has puzzled scholars and theologians alike. Theories abound, yet none can fully unravel the mystery of why such a figure holds a place of honor in this massive Christian tome. Some postulate that it serves as a dark mirror to the divine, a necessary counterpart to illuminate the virtue of the scriptures. Others whisper of sacrilege, of ancient curses, and forbidden rituals coded into the very likeness of the adversary. The parchment upon which the devil sits is as thick and durable as any other within the Codex, yet it is here that the book naturally falls open, as if this page has been turned to more often than all others, whether out of fascination or fear, it is impossible to say. The oils from countless fingers have left no mark, suggesting an unnatural resistance to the passage of time and human touch. As the chapter closes on this mysterious portrayal, the air seems to thrum with the echoes of a thousand silent sermons each one reflecting on the nature of this portrait. The Devil's Bible continues to hold its secret, the image of its infernal patron remaining as enigmatic as the day it was first inscribed onto the vellum, a silent sentinel watching over the Codex's labyrinthine depths. Beneath the vaulted ceilings of a secluded Bohemian monastery, a tale of desperation and dark dealings took root, giving life to the Codex Gigas. The legend begins with a monk whose name has been eroded by time, known to us only through the sin that condemned him. For an offense now lost in the fog of history, the monk faced an austere and grim punishment, immurement within the monastery's cold stone walls, a slow death by starvation and solitude. The doomed monk, cloistered in his narrow cell before the dawn of his final day, was afforded one last chance to appeal for his life. His plea was not one for mercy, but for redemption through an offering to the monastery, an offering so grand it would overshadow the transgressions of his mortal soul. He vowed to scribe a book of unprecedented scale and beauty, a volume that would exalt the monastery and glorify its collection with the entirety of human knowledge, the holy scriptures, and works of unsurpassed artistry. In return for his life, this book would be completed in a single night. As twilight's embrace wrapped the monastery, the monk began his impossible labor. By candlelight, his quill danced feverishly across the prepared vellum, but as hours slipped by, the enormity of his task became crushingly apparent. The shadows grew longer, the candle waned, and desperation sank its claws into the monk's heart. In the darkest hour, when hope had all but evaporated like the mist at dawn, the monk's prayers for salvation twisted into a summoning. His whispered chants ceased to echo off the divine, and instead called upon a power that lay in the shadows of God's grace. The air in the cell grew dense, the candlelight flickered violently, 
casting monstrous silhouettes that danced along the dank walls. Legend whispers that the monk, wrought with terror and awe, beheld a figure emerging from the darkness, none other than the devil himself, his presence an amalgam of the ethereal and the corporeal. A pact was struck in hushed tones, an exchange of eternal consequence, the monk's immortal soul for the devil's own hand in completing the manuscript. As the pact was sealed, the scriptorium was filled with an unnatural energy. The monk's quill flew across the pages with inhuman speed, the words flowing from an endless well of knowledge and sin. It was said that with each word inscribed, the monk's shadow grew fainter, as if his very essence was being siphoned into the vellum. By the first light of dawn, the monastery was roused by the miraculous sight of the completed Codex Gigas, an opus of divine and unholy texts, medical knowledge, exorcism rituals, and the full Latin Bible lay before them, a work of a lifetime condensed into a single night. The monks were astounded by the Codex's magnitude and beauty, the text unmarred by human error, each letter crafted with divine precision. Yet, a chill ran through the cloister as they turned to the portrait of the devil, a haunting reminder of the price of their brother's salvation, now sealed within the manuscript as if watching over his cursed bargain. The legend of the monk's pact with the devil, whether born of truth or concocted as a cautionary tale, has seeped into the very fibers of the Codex Gigas. It is a story that has transcended the monastery's stone walls, persisting through the ages as a spectral whisper that clings to the manuscript as surely as the ink that forms each character within. The Codex remains, but the monk's fate is a shadow lost to the annals of history, a specter lingering in the silence between the pages. In the chronicles of the Codex Gigas, the fourth thread unravels to reveal a scholar from the distant shores of enlightenment, obsessed with the legend of the book's infernal inception. His name was Father Augustus Clement, a man of the cloth whose faith was matched only by his insatiable curiosity for the arcane and the mysterious. His journey into the depths of the Codex's past was as much a pilgrimage as it was a scholarly pursuit. Father Clement's quarters were austere, but within its confines were scattered countless volumes on angelology, demonology, and ancient texts. Amidst this sea of knowledge, a single vacant space lay on his bookshelf, a reserved place for the book that had eluded his grasp, the Codex Gigas. He pored over reproductions of its pages, but mere facsimiles could not quench his thirst for the true experience of its aura. In the autumn of the year of our Lord, 1883, Father Clement received an invitation from the National Library, a chance to study the Codex Gigas firsthand. He traveled to Sweden, his mind a tempest of anticipation and dread, the legend of the monk's pact burning in his breast. Upon arriving, he was greeted by the librarian, a custodian of the tome, who shared in the scholarly respect for the manuscript, but held a noticeable unease when speaking of its origins. Father Clement was led to the alcove housing the codex, and as he approached, he felt a palpable shift in the air, a charge that tingled his skin and made the flame of the nearby candles stutter. With gloved hands, he opened the codex, the parchment emitting a faint, leathery scent. He was struck by the precision of the text, the uniformity of each character was unnatural, beyond the capabilities of even the most disciplined scribe. The illustrations were vibrant, defiant of their age, as if the pigment was bound not just with egg tempera, but with something more perennial. As Father Clement turned to the portrait of the devil, he could not escape the sensation that he was being scrutinized by those inked eyes judged by a being that understood the darkness hidden within the recesses of one's soul. The image was not merely drawn, but seemed imprinted into the page with a force that spoke of more than just artistic fervor. Night after night, Father Clement studied the manuscript, his eyes tracing over the Latin texts, the exorcism rituals, and the medical formulae. He noted margins filled with annotations in unknown scripts, strange diagrams, and celestial calculations that hinted at lost knowledge or forbidden wisdom. His dreams became haunted by visions of the monk, 
his spectral form whispering secrets that dance just beyond comprehension. The more Father Clement learned, the more he realized the Codex was a palimpsest of eras, a chronicle of collective consciousness that transcended its medieval origins. Its creation, he theorized, could not be attributed to a single lifetime, nor a single hand, human or otherwise. The scholar's obsession began to take its toll. His eyes grew tired, his thoughts frayed, and the initial exhilaration of his research warped into a quiet paranoia. Whispers in the dark corners of the library seemed to murmur his name, and the once precious daylight hours brought him no solace, for his thoughts remained chained to the shadows of the Codex. Despite his growing fears, Father Clement could not tear himself away. The Codex Gigas had become his anchor, his tormentor, and his greatest enigma. He penned his findings, his theories, and his fears in a private journal, a document that would become as much a part of the Codex's mythos as the manuscript itself. But amidst his notes, an unsettling pattern emerged, a realization that the deeper he delved into the mystery, the more the mystery seemed to delve into him. The scholar's quest for knowledge had led him down a path that many had walked before, a path that wove through the realms of the divine and the profane. Father Clement stood on the precipice of understanding, the edge where the light of reason met the darkness of the unknowable. It was here, in the silence of the alcove with the devil's Bible laid bare before him, that he penned the last entry in his journal, an entry that spoke of truths too perilous for the uninitiated, and of a covenant that stretched its fingers across the chasms of time. The lore of the Codex Gigas did not merely rest within the silent contemplation of holy confines, it extended its tendrils into the clandestine gatherings of secret societies. It was whispered that the manuscript contained coded wisdom that many would risk their lives to uncover. The fifth account unveils a shadowed chapter in the life of the Codex, where it became the coveted prize in a silent war waged by those who operated from the twilight of secrecy. In the waning years of the 19th century, a secret society known as the Fraternitas Saturni, the Brotherhood of Saturn, had grown particularly fixated on the Codex. Their lore was steeped in occult practices, and they believed that the manuscript held the key to ultimate knowledge, a compendium of arcane rituals that could grant dominion over the material and ethereal planes. The Brotherhood was led by a charismatic figure, a man of noble birth who bore the name Conradus Albrecht. His obsession with the Codex was unrivaled, his belief unwavering that within its pages lay the path to enlightenment and power. Albrecht pored over ancient alchemical texts, astrological charts, and the writings of mystics in an attempt to decipher the clues he believed were embedded within the Codex. Conradus's study was a labyrinth of esoteric paraphernalia. Astrolabes, geometric shapes, and cryptic scrolls adorned the walls. The centerpiece was a grand table upon which a replica of the Codex was opened its pages marked with annotations in Albrecht's meticulous handwriting. By night, the room flickered with candlelight, casting long shadows that seemed to play out scenes from the dark tales that surrounded the manuscript. At the same time, another society, the Order of the Rosy Cross, a brotherhood with roots in Hermetic and Christian mysticism, also sought the Codex. They believed that the manuscript contained lost biblical teachings and the truths of creation, obscured by allegories and symbols that only the truly enlightened could decipher. The Rosicrucians were more contemplative than the Brotherhood of Saturn, seeking wisdom and enlightenment rather than dominion. The Rosicrucian librarian, a venerable sage named Father Lorenz, believed that the Codex was a map of the divine mind its complexity a reflection of the intricate nature of God's creation. His approach to the Codex was one of reverence and humility. He spent his days in quiet study within a cloistered chamber where a single ray of sunlight fell upon his own copy of the book. His fingers, gnarled with age, traced the lines as if to divine some hidden pattern known only to the divine. The two societies watched each other with a mix of suspicion and envy 
each aware of the other's interest in the Codex. Albrecht's spies were adept at shadowing the Rosicrucians, gleaning scraps of insight that Lorenz and his acolytes unwittingly revealed. Yet, the Rosicrucians were not as naive as they seemed. Their own network of informants was woven into the fabric of European nobility and the Church, allowing them to anticipate the Brotherhood's moves. The secret pursuit of the Codex's mysteries became a silent battleground for these esoteric orders. Each society held meetings under the Veil of Night, where they discussed strategies to unlock the Codex's secrets. The Brotherhood performed rituals that they believed would invoke the Codex's latent energies, while the Rosicrucians engaged in meditation and prayer, seeking divine illumination. The Codex Gigas, bound in its ancient leather, became a contested relic, a touchstone for those who operated in the shadowed fringes of faith and reason. It was a symbol of power for some, a beacon of wisdom for others, but for all, it was an enigma that held an allure which was as perilous as it was irresistible. As the turn of the century neared, the conflict between these societies reached a zenith. Both had members within the church and the aristocracy, individuals who could influence the Codex's fate. The culmination of their struggle would be marked by a series of events that would shroud the manuscript in even greater mystery, leaving the world to wonder if the Codex had indeed revealed its true power, or if it had simply cast its spell over the minds of men. The pages of the Codex remained silent, a testament to the knowledge that could either illuminate the world or condemn it to darkness. As the 20th century dawned, the Codex Gigas found itself not only the subject of academic and ecclesiastic study, but also at the heart of a much darker and clandestine legacy. The sixth chapter of its mysterious saga unfolds within the confines of an ancient European noble house whose lineage was as old as the legends surrounding the Codex itself, the House of Schwarzenberg. The Schwarzenberg lineage was a tapestry woven with threads of power, politics, and secret knowledge. Within the private library of their ancestral castle, nestled amid the austere mountains of Bohemia, lay hidden a collection of the rarest manuscripts, but none so coveted as the Devil's Bible. It was whispered among the elite that the Schwarzenberg family held a secret copy of the Codex, an heirloom passed down through generations, bound not in mere leather, but in the shadows of their lineage. Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Schwarzenberg, the patriarch at the turn of the century, was a man shrouded in mystery, possessing an intellect as sharp as the swords that lined his forefather's hall. His features were stern, often illuminated by the ghostly light of a single oil lamp as he pored over ancient texts late into the night. His obsession with the Codex was not driven by superstition, but by a fervent belief that within its pages lay a profound ancestral connection and a power that could influence the destiny of nations. The Baron's study was an alcove of antiquity, walls adorned with tapestries depicting battles and mythology, and a heavy oak desk cluttered with astrological instruments and cryptic diagrams. The centermost piece was a grand bookstand, where the family's version of the Codex Gigas lay open, its pages a mirror to the past, and a map to an unknown future. Baron Friedrich often conducted private viewings of the manuscript for those of similar rank and fascination with the occult. Among the select few was a mysterious figure known only as Countess Elizabeth, whose pallor and penetrating gaze suggested she was no stranger to the enigmas of life and death. Her interest in the Codex seemed to go beyond mere curiosity, bordering on a spiritual pilgrimage. Rumors suggested that she was the last scion of an arcane order that had sought the Codex for centuries. As World War I loomed on the horizon, a sense of urgency enveloped the Schwarzenberg estate. The Baron believed that the Codex held prophecies and arcane knowledge that could safeguard his house through the turbulence of war. He began a meticulous study of its apocalyptic texts, seeking signs and portents among its cryptic illuminations. Friedrich's dedication to deciphering the Codex's prophetic messages became an all-consuming task. He was rarely seen without its pages spread before him, his eyes scanning the Latin text for veiled references to current events. 
The Baron believed that the conflicts of man were reflected in the celestial movements and that the Codex contained the celestial keys to understanding and possibly altering these tumultuous times. As the war ravaged Europe, the Schwarzenberg Codex was said to travel with the Baron to the battlegrounds, cloaked in secrecy and guarded by a cadre of loyal men who believed in its talismanic power. It was rumored that the Baron's strategic prowess in battle was not merely a result of his military acumen, but also influenced by the dark auguries gleaned from the pages of the Codex. In the war's aftermath, the Schwarzenberg estate stood as a bastion in a changed world, but the Baron himself was altered. His eyes, once full of determination, now carried the weight of unspeakable knowledge. The secrets of the Codex and the burden of its revelations had etched lines of sorrow upon his face that no hand of time could have wrought. The Codex Gigas, with its ominous portrait of the devil and its enigmatic contents, remained the most prized and enigmatic possession of the Schwarzenberg Library. To the world, the Codex was a relic of medieval times, but to those like Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Schwarzenberg, it was a living testament to the eternal dance between power, knowledge, and the inescapable destiny of humankind. The heirloom of shadows continued to cast its influence, a legacy that was both a gift and a curse to those who possessed it. The seventh chapter of the Codex Gigas enigmatic journey whispers of a clandestine assembly, known as the Cryptic Conclave, which emerged from the turmoil of the post-war world. This league of scholars, mystics, and historians, cloaked in secrecy, dedicated themselves to deciphering the deepest mysteries of the Codex, operating from the shadows of a world scarred by conflict. The year was 1924, and the world was still licking its wounds from the Great War. In the heart of Europe, where the old empires had crumbled, the cryptic conclave convened for the first time in an abandoned monastery that had survived the ages, its spires reaching up like hands praying for salvation. This fortress of solitude was selected for its isolation and its library, a repository of lost knowledge, where the dust of centuries covered tomes of forgotten lore. At the center of the conclave was Dr. Victor Casper, a linguist and occultist whose life's work had been the study of ancient manuscripts with a particular obsession over the Codex Gigas. His fascination with the book was not merely academic. He believed that it was a cipher for understanding the universe's deepest secrets. Dr. Casper's figure was often seen, a silhouette against the dim light of his study, as he transcribed passages from the Codex with a trembling hand, his eyes reflecting a mind that danced on the edge of revelation and madness. Accompanying him, was Dr. Elena Dubrovnik, a Russian codebreaker who had fled the Bolshevik Revolution. Her analytical mind and expertise in cryptography made her an invaluable asset to the Conclave. She viewed the Codex not as a religious or mystical artifact, but as a challenge, a puzzle woven through time, waiting for the right mind to unlock its secrets. The Conclave gathered under the veil of night, illuminated by flickering candlelight that cast long, dancing shadows upon the ancient stone walls. Each member wore a mask that bore symbols reflective of their area of expertise, alchemy, astrology, Kabbalah, and other esoteric disciplines. The air was thick with incense and expectation as they pooled their knowledge in the hope of achieving a breakthrough. Their meetings were a ritualistic affair. Dr. Casper would often begin by reading aloud a passage from the Codex, his voice echoing through the chamber, imbuing the words with a power that seemed to transcend their meaning. Discussions would unfold into the early hours, with each member proposing theories on the Codex's origins, its purpose, and the implications of its most mysterious passages. The Conclave was particularly intrigued by the alignment of astrological charts within the Codex and how they corresponded with historical events. They pondered whether the book could predict future occurrences or if its inscriptions had somehow influenced the course of history itself. Within the confines of their meeting place, the cryptic conclave amassed a vast array of research material, old maps marked with astrological symbols, manuscripts detailing the trials of medieval witches, 
and texts on the art of necromancy. Every piece was a part of the puzzle, and the Codex Gigas was the grim centerpiece, casting its enigmatic shadow over all their endeavors. As the months passed, the members of the Conclave began to experience strange occurrences, visions and dreams, cryptic messages appearing in their research, and a sense of being watched by unseen eyes. Paranoia crept into their ranks as they delved deeper into the occult aspects of the Codex. Some members feared they had awakened something ancient and malevolent, a force that had lain dormant within the manuscript's pages. Despite the growing unease, their work persisted, driven by a mixture of fear, curiosity, and the unyielding human desire to know the unknowable. The cryptic conclave's findings were meticulously recorded in a series of leather-bound journals, which became almost as cryptic as the Codex itself. The chapter of the cryptic conclave remains a veiled footnote in the history of the Codex Gigas, a testament to humanity's enduring fascination with the arcane and the lengths to which they will go to uncover the truth. In their quest for knowledge, the members of the conclave discovered more than they bargained for as they stared into the abyss of the Codex, only to find it staring back into them. As the roar of the 1920s gave way to the uncertainty of the 1930s, the Codex Giga's journey brought it within the hallowed and secretive walls of the Vatican. It was within these sacred confines that the eighth chapter of the Codex's tale unfolded, a chapter replete with whispered secrets and the quest for divine knowledge. The arrival of the Codex Gigas at the Vatican was shrouded in as much mystery as its contents. Rumor had it that the tome was transported under the cover of night, arriving in a wooden crate devoid of any markings, save for a single, unassuming cross. It was brought to the Apostolic Archive, a repository for the most sacred and confidential documents of the Church, where the air was thick with the musk of aged parchment and the weight of history. Cardinal Augusto de Angelis, the archive's prefect, was given the monumental task of studying the manuscript. The cardinal, a man of deep faith and profound learning, possessed a countenance that was both stern and serene, reflecting a lifetime spent in the pursuit of spiritual wisdom. His quarters were modest, but his study was a bastion of knowledge, with ceiling-high bookshelves and artifacts that spanned the breadth of Christian history. The Cardinal was joined by Father Giuseppe Bellini, a younger clergyman with an affinity for languages and ancient texts. Father Bellini's eyes, always alight with intellectual fervor, became almost incandescent with the arrival of the Codex. Together, the two men embarked on the Herculean task of examining the vast manuscript, page by immense page, under the strictest confidentiality. Their work was meticulous and exhaustive. They employed the latest in scholarly techniques, from careful textual analysis to attempts at deciphering hidden codes within the illuminations. Each folio was treated with reverence and caution, as though the very act of turning a page might trigger some arcane trap or divine test. By candlelight, they pored over the enigmatic image of the devil, which seemed to mock their efforts with a silent, sardonic grin. They scrutinized the image for hidden meanings, employing mirrors and looking for patterns that could be revealed by the interplay of light and shadow. Their research extended to the exorcism rites and the depiction of heaven and hell, seeking an understanding of the theological implications the Codex might hold. As they delved deeper, Cardinal DeAngelis and Father Bellini began to encounter anomalies within the text, passages that appeared to be inconsistent with liturgical norms, peculiar choice of saints, and certain illustrations that did not conform to canonical art. The two men speculated that the manuscript might be a palimpsest of sorts, containing layers of knowledge that transcended its surface narrative. The Cardinal, ever cautious, began to entertain the notion that the Codex might hold knowledge that was meant to be concealed, perhaps even from the Church itself. He speculated in hushed tones that the book might be a test of faith, a divine riddle that challenged the reader to discern truth from heresy. At night, the halls of the Vatican seemed to resonate with the whispered prayers of centuries, and the scholars felt the weight of unseen eyes upon them. 
It was during these nocturnal hours that Father Bellini reported strange occurrences, unexplained chills, the scent of burning incense when none was lit, and the persistent feeling of being observed by an intangible presence. Despite these disturbances, or perhaps because of them, the Cardinal and Father Bellini's dedication to uncovering the Codex's mysteries only intensified. They documented their findings in a series of elaborate codicils, which were locked away in the most secure vaults of the Vatican, accessible only to a select few within the Church's highest echelons. The exact nature of their discoveries remains cloaked in the Church's sacred confidence, leading to speculation and legend among those who study the Codex's past. The whispers in the Vatican vaults speak of secrets too profound and potentially disturbing for the world at large, secrets that could challenge the very foundations of faith and the Church's role in the interpretation of divine will. As World War II approached, the Vatican braced for turmoil, and the Codex Gigas, within its walls, seemed to be an ancient sentinel, watching over the unfolding of human events with a silent, knowing gaze. The Cardinal and Father Bellini's legacy became one of whispered lore, a chapter in the Codex's history veiled by the sanctity of their oath to the Church and the impenetrable mystery of the manuscript they sought to understand. The ninth chapter of the Codex Gigas' enigmatic existence unfurls against the backdrop of the Cold War, a period where secrets and shadows were currencies as potent as arms and gold. In this age of espionage and ideological rivalry, the Codex found itself sequestered behind the Iron Curtain, in the possession of the Soviet Union, its presence there as enigmatic as the dark passages within its leaves. The year was 1968, and whispers of the Codex had reached the ears of the KGB, the Soviet security agency known for its ruthless efficiency and covert operations. Soviet interest in the Codex was not rooted in spirituality, but in the potential harnessing of its mysteries for psychological warfare. To them, the Codex was not a relic, but a tool, possibly a weapon with applications yet to be realized. It was under the steely eye of General Anatoly Sedov, a man as inscrutable and relentless as the agency he served, that the Codex was brought to a clandestine research facility buried deep within the Ural Mountains. This facility, known only by its codename, Aurora, was the epicenter of the USSR's efforts to explore and exploit paranormal phenomena and psychological manipulation for strategic advantage. Within Aurora's concrete walls and sterile chambers, a select team was assembled to probe the Codex's mysteries. This team was a melange of scholars in ancient languages, cryptographers, and even psychics, all gathered under the banner of Project Vetustatum Obscurum, or Ancient Darkness. The project was led by Dr. Marina Orlova, a brilliant linguist and historian whose stoic demeanor belied a relentless curiosity about the Codex's true capabilities. Dr. Orlova and her team worked in isolation, the outside world a distant reality compared to the immediacy of their task. The facility was suffused with a perpetual artificial light, blanching all sense of time, as the team examined the Codex in shifts that blurred day into night. They were particularly fascinated by the infamous full-page portrait of the devil, often speculating on its significance. Was it a mere depiction of evil, or a symbolic guardian to deeper secrets within the manuscript? They pondered the juxtaposition of the kingdom of heaven and hell, considering psychological implications and exploring the idea that the images might induce fear or subservience, a useful trait if it could be weaponized. The team employed a variety of methods in their research, from X-ray fluorescence imaging to reveal underdrawings and compositions to attempts at contacting the spiritual realm for insights into the book's creation. The KGB was interested in the potential of uncovering hidden messages or codes that could be employed in the realm of espionage or mind control. One of the most enigmatic findings was a series of marginalia that appeared to be written in an unknown code. Dr. Orlova, with her team of cryptographers, spent countless hours attempting to decipher these notes, 
hypothesizing they could be the key to unlocking the Codex's secrets. They used everything from traditional paper and pencil analysis to the latest in computer algorithms, but the code remained elusive, as if mocking their efforts. As the research continued, reports began to surface among the team members of strange incidents within the facility. Unexplained malfunctions in the equipment, shadowy figures seen out of the corner of the eye, and a persistent, inexplicable chill in the room housing the Codex. These occurrences were noted but largely dismissed by the scientific minds of the team as stress-induced hallucinations. The project's findings were meticulously documented, though much of the research remained classified, known only to the highest echelons of Soviet intelligence. In the declassified scraps that have surfaced, cryptic references to Operation Lucifer and the Devil's Script allude to the KGB's continued interest in the Codex and its potential applications. The Codex Giga's time in the Soviet Union remains one of the most secretive epochs in its history. The shadow it cast during this period is one tinged with the paranoia and clandestine operations of the time, and what knowledge was gleaned, or what operations were influenced by its presence, remains largely a matter for speculation and hushed rumors. As the Soviet Union approached its final years, the fate of the Codex during this period became as enigmatic as the text itself. Its whispers through the halls of Aurora left an indelible mark on the Cold War's secret history, a chapter defined by the search for power in the unlikeliest of forms. In the early 21st century, the Codex Gigas entered its most paradoxical chapter yet, as it became the subject of intense study not within the secretive enclaves of scholars or under the vigilant gaze of empires, but in the transparent and chaotic realm of the digital world. The manuscript, once guarded by fortresses and vaults, was now accessible to any curious soul with internet access. The initiative to digitize the Codex Gigas was spearheaded by an international coalition of historians, librarians, and technologists united under the conviction that the secrets of the past should be unlocked for the benefit of all humanity. Their project, codenamed Liber Accessum, Book of Access, was a mammoth undertaking, matching the Codex's own physical heft. The venue for this unprecedented work was the National Library of Sweden, where the Codex had resided in relative tranquility for over a century. Under the vigilant eyes of experts, the tome was carefully transported to a specially designed laboratory that balanced strict temperature and humidity controls with an array of digital scanning equipment. Dr. Linnea Agnes, the project's lead historian, was a woman whose life's passion was the preservation of medieval texts. Her team was diverse, consisting of preservation experts, digital archivists, and a security detail well aware of the Codex's storied past. The operation was surgical in its precision. Each page was delicately turned and scanned using high-definition imaging technology, revealing not just the visible text, but also the palimpsest of history beneath. The imaging technology was sophisticated, capable of penetrating layers of ink to reveal lost writings and alterations, utilizing infrared and ultraviolet spectrums to uncover what the naked eye could not see. As the digital pages accumulated, the team began to unravel a tapestry of annotations, sketches, and marginalia that were previously indistinct or invisible. Amidst these findings, the team stumbled upon a revelation that would challenge their understanding of the Codex. Through multispectral imaging, they discovered faint scribblings in the margins that were invisible to generations of scholars before. These writings appeared to be annotations made by an unknown hand, possibly dating back to the Codex's creation. The nature of these notes was cryptic, a mix of archaic languages and diagrams, leading to a flurry of excitement and conjecture about their origin and meaning. The digitization process also unveiled peculiarities in the parchment itself. The animal hides used in the Codex varied in thickness and texture, and Dr. Agnes hypothesized that the selection of skins might correlate with the thematic elements of the corresponding texts. This detail suggested a level of premeditation 
and sophistication that was unprecedented for a manuscript of its time. As the digital codex took shape, a parallel narrative emerged in the online world. Enthusiasts and amateur sleuths began to aggregate around forums and social media, sharing theories and insights. The Devil's Portrait, once the subject of hushed academic debate, was now a viral sensation, inciting a digital pilgrimage seeking understanding, or perhaps enlightenment. The collective efforts of the online community were as varied as they were imaginative. Codebreakers, using the newly available high-resolution images, embarked on fresh attempts to decipher the mysterious marginalia. Folklorists and theologians cross-referenced the Codex's texts with other ancient sources, searching for patterns that might reveal its deeper intentions. In this digital era, the Codex Gigas was no longer a singular, bound entity, but a fragmented construct scattered across servers and hard drives, subject to the interpretations and imaginations of countless individuals. Its legend proliferated in bytes and pixels, forming a modern mythology as compelling as any of its former chapters. Dr. Agnes and her team continued their work, conscious of the growing digital footprint of the Codex. They published their findings in exhaustive detail, contributing to the global conversation and occasionally guiding it with their expert insight. Yet, the Codex seemed to defy complete understanding, each discovery leading to new questions, each page turn revealing further mysteries. The digitization project culminated in the entire Codex being made available online, a democratization of knowledge that was as groundbreaking as it was unsettling. The once ominous tome, associated with curses and dark lore, had transcended its physical form to become a part of the collective human consciousness. The Codex's final chapter is yet to be written as it continues to challenge, fascinate, and inspire. In the digital age, the Codex Giga stands as a testament to humanity's enduring quest for knowledge and the lengths to which we will go to preserve and understand our history. As it bridges the gap between the medieval and the modern, the Codex remains an enduring enigma, a digital phantom that whispers ancient secrets into a world of silicon and electric light. Thank you everyone for watching this wonderful video. If you did enjoy, once again, please make sure to hit the like button. Let me know in the comment section how you did enjoy the story, and I will see you in the next mystery video. Peace.